I've seen that uh, video several times, and every time it just touches my heart to see how our lives and our stories, uh, without us even knowing, can touch someone else's life and can have a great impact in their life and cause them to, to have life-changing results in their lives. Uh, you never know what God's doing. And I think one of the great joys of heaven is going to be to find out how when we didn't even know God was doing something, he used us in somebody else's life, and it had eternal consequences. So that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the power of our story. So let me give you some words. When I say a word, I want you to tell me what comes immediately to your mind, okay? First word is Super Bowl. Okay, <laughs> different things come to our minds evidently, all right? When I say the word Mona, what comes to you? Lisa, okay. Uh, when A smile, all right. Uh, when I say the word diet, what comes to your word? Uh, all kinds of horrible things come to our minds, all right? Uh, let me give you another one now. When I say this, tell me what comes to your mind. Born again Christian. What comes to your mind? You know, I think in our culture today, a lot of people would say, Oh, that's someone who's kind of haughty. They're kind of judgmental. They're kind of stick to themselves. They're kind of narrow and rigid. They, they're self-righteous. They're haughty. They um, use religion as a crutch to get through life. A lot of people make those kind of statements about those of us who profess to know Christ as our Savior. What I hope a lot of people would say are statements like these. They're full of integrity. They're full of moral courage and compassion. They have a concern for the poor, and, and they're very generous. They are humble. They have an inner strength. And I, 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 those are the things that we want to hear people say about us because of the way our story of life is being lived out through their lives. I also hope that when we share our faith with them, they would make statements like this. When Christ followers talk about God, they're just so clear in what they say. They're so pumped up about their faith. And they are humble. They're interesting. They're interested in me. Well, that's the power of story. And so the question we always need to be asking is, what kind of story are we telling and sharing with others? Um... I don't know whether you realize it or not, but every one of our lives here in this room, every one of us, our lives are just a series of stories. Our story began probably back with Adam and Eve and all the people after that, but especially with our parents, moms, and dads. Because our parents, moms, and dads, they had a love story. And that love story resulted in our parents' love story. And out of their love story came our birth, the story of our birth. And then out of that came our home life, what we experienced, where we lived, what our culture was like. Out of that came our family story, our moms, our dads, our grandmas, grandpas, our uncles, our aunts, our brothers, our sisters, and how we interacted, and all of the stories that are part of our family story. And then there's our education story, and our education story has had a huge impact on our lives. And, and as I'm saying this, I, I think about each of these, and I could talk for hours about each of these things. Not so much about my birth, I don't remember that much about it. But the rest of them, I could talk for hours about my home life and my family, and I could talk about my education, and then there's our dating, and if you're married, our marriage stories, and those can go on for hours. Then there's our children, and we love to show the pictures and tell the stories of all the things that our children do and have done. Then there's our careers, our career story. Maybe you've had more than one, and you could tell the stories of how all of those things have happened. Over the years, I could, I could bore you for two days telling you my career story. 
been interesting. And then later in our life, there's our aches and pains stories and our surgery stories and our medication stories, you know? It's interesting when you get a group of older people together, that's a lot of what you hear about. Well, I'm going into surgery Monday, you know? We have our stories. And our stories are powerful. So let me make a promise to you as we begin. And that promise is this. Once we commit to become witnesses, those are people who are willing to be used to tell others about Christ. Once we commit and say, I'm going to get out of my shell, I'm going to get out of my insecurity, and I'm going to be willing to share my story, Lord. If you give me the opportunity, I'll share my story. Once we commit to do that, God will give us opportunities to tell others our story. Please know, God's more interested in you and me sharing our story than we are. And he wants to give us opportunities every week, every day. And he brings people into our lives, and, and they're waiting, many of them, to hear somebody's story. And we all have a story. But, but we've got to be really careful how we communicate that. The Bible's very clear about it. Over in the Old Testament, in Proverbs 16.24, it says, Kind words are like honey. <laughs> I think that's such a cool statement. I mean, it, it, kind words are kind of humble, and they're healing, and they're wise, and they're gentle, and they're grace-filled. And it says those kind of words are like honey, and they are sweet to the soul, and they bring health to the body. We all need to hear kind words. But then 1 Peter 3.15 says, When you're telling your story, in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. In other words, remember, as you're telling your story, he's got to speak it through you. you. You have no power. The Holy Spirit has the power. He's got to speak it through you. And he says, In your hearts revere Christ as Lord always. Be prepared. To give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. In other words, if someone says, why do you have faith? Why do you have hope? Why do you have peace in the midst of a storm of life? You can tell your story. But he says the way you tell your story is do it with gentleness and respect. Respect for that other person. And you don't try to cram your story down their throat. You just tell your story with words that are like honey that bring healing to the body. And 1 Corinthians 14.9 adds to that. It says, if you speak to people in words they don't understand, and this is something we have to be careful with as Christians because a lot of us know a lot of churchy words, you know? And I will tell you a majority of the people that we tell our story to don't understand our churchy words. So 1 Corinthians says, if you speak to people in words they don't understand, this is just common sense, how will they know what you're saying? You might as well be talking into empty space. In other words, when we share our story, be sure we're speaking in language that people will understand. And it'll communicate our love, God's truth, God's love, and the story of Christ to them. Now, when we share our story, there are three things that make our story real. Those three things are these. The first part of our story is what our lives were like before Jesus. The second part is our experience of receiving Christ. Who was involved in telling their story to us, and what was the story, and where was that all taking place? A, a lot of that, my story, you tell about how God worked to bring you to Christ, and then how our lives are changed because of receiving Christ. So this is before, this is our salvation, and this is after. And that's all our story has to be. Before, Salvation after. I was raised in a wonderful home. Uh, my mom and dad loved me. They provided for me. They protected me. They believed in me. My mom was a, a godly woman who 
modeled Christ before me all my life. And um, she taught me about the Lord. And I was in church three times a week at least and uh, learned a lot about Christ. But it didn't really have any impact on my life. You know, I, I was seven when I got saved, but I don't have one of these exciting stories. I, I listen to some of these stories, and they're just so exciting. I was an addict, and I was a druggie, and I murdered three people, and I robbed seven banks, you know. Those are exciting stories. I don't have anything like that. I was just a kind of a snotty-nosed, nice little Christian kid, or kid, who needed Christ, and I remember being raised up in that home and family, hearing all that stuff all my life, but it didn't have any impact on my life until one morning. And I remember it clearly. One morning at seven years of age, I woke up, and for the first time in my life, I realized I had sinned against God. And I was brokenhearted about it. And I tried all day to get away from that feeling, from that understanding. And that afternoon, I finally gave in, and I said, Mom, would you pray with me? We knelt down by a chair in our dining room there, and I remember asking Christ. My mom helped me pray, but, but I asked Christ to come into my heart and life and forgive me of my seven-year-old sinfulness. And I meant it with all my being. And I know he became my savior that day, but three years later when I was 10, I was at Crystal Lake Baptist Youth Camp and Uncle George on Friday night at the fireside thing down by the lake, he was preaching away and teaching us. And, and I remember uh, going back to my room and I was on the top bunk and I was looking through the window and, and I was thinking to myself, uh, I'm not sure a seven-year-old kid could understand what it means to be saved, but now that I'm mature and 10... I really can understand. And so at 10 years of age, I remember once again saying, Lord, I never want to doubt my salvation. And so once again, I just ask you, be my savior and be the leader of my life. I remember that so clearly. And I can tell you from that day to this day, I've never had a doubt of my salvation. I know Christ forgave me of my sin. I know he came to live in my life through his spirit. And I know that he has been very, very good. That's the rest of my story. I, I've watched the Lord over these last many, many years, decades, lead and guide and protect and bless and use. And, and I stand here very humbly before you today saying, it's all because of that day when I asked Christ to come into my life that the blessings and, and the opportunities and, and the privilege of being here with you this morning, it's all because of Christ. Now that's my story. And it's as simple as that. It's as succinct as that. It's as clear as that. It's as easy as that. Our before and after story doesn't have to be more com complicated than that. The Apostle Paul, he loved to tell his story. And he was being put on trial one day and it's very interesting because he was standing before King Agrippa and they had a jury that had the potential of sentencing him to death because of his preaching about Christ. And when they asked him why he was doing that, he told them his story. It's over in Acts chapter 26. And I'd like for you to look at it because I've kind of cut it way down just to, to make it uh, easy for us to hear and understand. But he stood before the jury and he told them his before story. He said, I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppress the very name of Jesus the Nazarene. I mean, he was involved in, in persecuting Christians and even agreeing to them being sentenced to death. He was involved that way as as a, a Roman Jew. And he says, indeed, I, had dis I did just that in Jerusalem. That's my before story. I was involved in persecuting Christians. Then he tells about his salvation. He says, one day, I was on such a mission to Damascus. I was going to get those Christians. About noon... A light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shone down on me and my companions. 
We all fell down, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? (laughs) By persecuting Christians, he was persecuting the Lord, and he came to realize that. It is useless for you to fight against my will, Paul. Who are you, Lord? I asked, and the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Now get to your feet, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and my witness. Tell people that you have seen me, and tell them what I will show you in the future. Paul's salvation story. He met Jesus. That day he was humbled before Christ. Christ became not only the forgiver of his sin, but the Lord and leader of his life. So you've seen his before, you've seen his salvation, here's his after. And so, King Agrippa, (laughs) I obeyed that vision from heaven. I preached first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that all must repent of their sins and turn to God. That... Simple, humble, succinct, and true story was Paul's story. And right there, he had had his witness before the king and the jury of judges. Before, salvation, after. I want you to listen And listen carefully, we have a little tech problem today, so you're going to hear it probably out of just one speaker, but this is Manuel, young man who was baptized here a few months ago, and he has a very powerful story for the next two and a half minutes of his before, his salvation, and then after what Christ has done in his life. My life before Christ would be full of selfishness, um, not a lot of control with myself, like emotionally. I didn't pay attention to it much first until later on I started to slowly realize how bad it, it was starting to affect me. I saw that begin to change after I started going to One Youth. I've always struggled with youth groups and just because they never made me like feel comforted or welcomed there. And this youth group made me feel more welcomed and and I, like it made me feel a sense of comfort. So something had kept drawing me back here to the specific youth group. And it just overall, over time became a daily, like a weekly routine for me. I would say that I met Christ during summer camp and it started clicking to me and making sense to me. My youth pastor, Brandon, Uh, He came to talk to me about uh, Christ and how I felt about it, how I felt about Him. Again, it was making sense to me, so I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I want to accept this. I'm gonna take what Jesus has for me and accept it. And then that that, that same night, I was when I accepted Christ. Over time, after I met Christ, uh, I can tell I was starting to get better control of my emotions, my anger. Um, my Most of my self-doubt was starting to go away, my anxiety was going away, and just basically how overwhelmed I was with my life. And overall, it's uh, had me starting to care for my friends. I wasn't acting as selfish. I was starting to build a better relationship with Christ and getting to understand and know Him even better than I already did. If it's through my friends, uh, through youth group, or literally anywhere. The amount of love that he has given me and how much he's shown it to me, like, again, through my friends, whether we have one of those days where we're just down for no reason. He was always there and never stopped showering me with the love that he had for me. And he sacrificed his only son for us and paid the price for our sins, which was really major for all of us. And. No one in this world can love you more than God. Uh, 
succinct, clear, um, honest, and humble. So, how we praise God for the story. That's Manuel's story. What's yours? <clears throat> if you know Christ as your Savior, you have a story. Because you have a before, and then someone or something came into your life through God's grace and brought you to a point of humility and repentance to believe in Christ and let Him become your Savior and your leader. And then you have a story afterwards. Here's what God has done in my life and through my life. And, and I think we, we get afraid of witnessing because we think, <clears throat> oh my goodness, I, people are going to ask me questions I don't know the answer, and people are going to say things that aren't nice about me because I'm trying to share my faith. No, you just, you just daily say, Lord, I want to be your witness. And you open the door at the right time, and you give me the right words, and I'll tell my story. I'm not ashamed of you, Lord. And it'll be amazing how God will bring those neighbors or those friends or the family or the co-workers or the teammates. Bring them to you in your life. Brandon, thank you for your ministry to Manuel your witness, your story, and how that blessed and changed his life forever. That's what this thing called our faith and our witness and our Christianity is all about. So let me close with just three things. Principles to remember as we tell our story. The first is this. The priority is always people. Yeah, I think a lot of times you say, well, I'm just not real good with people. I, I can't talk to people. Fooey. Of course you can. God gave you a mouth and a voice. You can. It's just sometimes we're shy, which means you're insecure, or sometimes we just are afraid they're not going to like us or they're not going to want to hear. Well, if God opens the door and, and, and you'll know when he does, man, don't be afraid to walk through it. Because it's about people. See? You and I need to build our lives around accepting people and getting to know people and caring about people and serving people and listening to people and then having the opportunity to expose them to Christ. So the first priority in witnessing is we've got to ask God, help me to love you, Lord, with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, but help me to love my neighbor as I love myself. Give me a love for people and a concern for people's eternal destiny. Then second, the focus has to be on potential. Okay? What that means is we always, when we see people, when we meet people, when we come in contact with people, we look beyond what we see right now. Because many times when you meet some people, especially people who are involved in things they ought not be involved in, and that's so many people today. Attitudes, relationships, involvements, addictions. You look at it and you say, man, there's no hope for that person. They're not interested in my story. Oh, hey, they're more interested in your story than you know. And so we have to look past what we see right now and focus on the potential. Look past the self-centeredness and see the potential for servanthood. Look past the rebelliousness and see the potential for righteousness and look past the quick temper and see the potential for godly ministry. I mean, God does this all the time. You have to realize one day God looked at you <laughs> and he looked at me and he saw us right in the middle of our sinfulness, which should have resulted in eternal separation from him. But he looked at our potential, and he ran all the way across the universe to allow his son to go to the cross, to live a perfect life, to die a perfect death, to pay the penalty for our sins, and to be resurrected so he could offer eternal life 
to all who would believe. So the priority is always people, and the focus is always on potential. Look what this person can become. I don't care what they are now. I don't care what they're involved in now. I don't care what they've done in their past. We all have a past before story. Now is the day of salvation. Now is that opportunity for Christ to work. So we look at that potential. And then the third thing is, we realize <laughs> that the reward in witnessing is eternal. It's eternal. No, I don't know whether you and I think about this very much, because we give so much of our time and talents and treasures to get stuff for ourselves. That's what, uh, that's what America's all about. <laughs> Get more stuff for yourself. And I don't know if we stop and realize very often that no earthly possession that we have is going to heaven. Our lands aren't going to go to heaven. Our homes aren't going to go to heaven. <laughs> Our uh, money isn't going to go to heaven. Uh, the government's going to get it all anyway, you know. Our titles, our achievements... Our fame. All those things are just such a momentary little glitch. The only thing that makes it to heaven besides the truth of God and God himself is people. Only people. And so God's challenge to us as believers in Christ, those of us who can say, I know that I am a follower of Jesus and I have been washed clean by his shed blood on the cross of Calvary through faith in what he did for me, those of us who are believers need to pray for the people God brings into our world. That's our friends, our family, our co-workers, our neighbors, our teammates, everybody else that's in your world. I said last week, I can't touch most of the people that are in your world. You can't touch most of the people that are in my world. That's why God says, I want you to see the world I've put you in, the people I brought you near, the, the ones that I've involved your life in. That's your mission field. That's your witness opportunity. And we need to let Christ live his life through our life and let others sense his love, his truth, his compassion, his availability through us. That's the power of our story. And the Lord, I want to remind you again, says 1 Peter 3, 15 through 16, if someone asks about your Christian hope, and you get involved in their lives and let the love of Christ come through your life to them, they will ask. One way or another, they will be open to hear your powerful story. If someone asks about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. Don't be afraid. Just tell before. Christ, salvation, after it's as easy, it's as succinct, it's as powerful as that. This fall, we have a unique opportunity in our city because two weeks from now, Will Graham is coming with a crusade. He's the grandson of Billy Graham and uh, is being used of God all across the nation. And there's just a wonderful opportunity to invite our friends. I'm inviting unsaved friends to come with Judy and me. And I'm trying to prepare them before that for what they'll hear. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to start praying for some friends. I would encourage you, if you didn't get one of these last Sunday, there are one or two of them on your table. I hope you'll take it because inside is the place for you to write your names of the people that God has in your world that you're going to be praying for and hopefully inviting. 
October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, you'll hear about it in a moment. Down at the well, a great opportunity to witness, to share, maybe to open up some witness after the meeting of how Christ has worked in your life. Don't miss the opportunities that will come this week, that come October 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and come all the time to tell the powerful story that God has given us through faith in His Son. Father, I thank you so much for uh, this time to just be challenged by Paul and by Manuel and by your word to be people who are not afraid, who are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but are very, very much in love with you and very open to all that you want to do through our lives to share your love and truth with them. Lord, I pray this week you will open doors of witnessing opportunity, that you will surprise each of us with those chances, and that, God, we will uh, take it as a priority. We will look beyond their current story and see the powerful new story you could write in their lives through faith in you. We love you. We yield anew and afresh to what you want for our lives. And God, I pray in advance for this crusade that we'll all take advantage of it and invite our uh, unchurched and perhaps unsaved friends to go with us and hear your word through music and through a powerful message proclaimed so well. To you be the glory. We love you. I thank you for every person in this room. Help us to leave here more committed to be those witnesses that you promised to use for your glory. And help us to have eternal reward because of it. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it and thank you, Lord.